This is Peggy Ann Saltz, and this is In the Groove at 5 o'clock within Moby. Chilling out perhaps a bit with my guest, Dirac Desai, Director of Sales, Growth, and Strategy at InMobi. And did a little bit of digging into your background as well. I mean, it's a little bit of been there, done that. Mm -hmm. You've seen it from the publisher side in the early 2010s when you were trying to monetize your app, so you know the pain there. And then ending up in sales and strategy at the DSP side, all mm -hmm. working at the same time with top brands, top companies across verticals. It's an experience that's given you probably a bit of a challenge, and challenges, I think, are what you really do get into. But we're here, into the groove, it's a place, it's a state of mind, it's a hobby, it's a zone. What gets you into the groove? Well, uh, I think there are different things that bring me to the, to the groove, but I think for me, the primary thing is just a challenge. I think you kind of mentioned it about this, uh, you know, that there's always everything, every difficult problem in the world has some challenge to it. And I think for me, just knowing that there's something we can go and fix and solve for, I think that that's what gets me in the groove. And then I also have my own moments where I'm just uh, drinking coffee and just sitting under a tree and just hanging out sometimes. You know? Well, that's when all the good ideas come, yeah. though. Yeah, exactly. That is when they yeah. all come. Absolutely. And you do like a challenge. It begins and ends with education with you. Mm -hmm. That's what I find so fascinating. Not just your position within InMobi, and we'll get to that in a moment, how you're educating the ecosystem, educating marketers. But I was really touched because it's your passion as well. You work with underprivileged kids mm -hmm. in areas of the world where they don't have access mm -hmm. to programming, education, mm -hmm. computer science education. And it made me think back in the day, there was a colleague of mine, he said it was all about program or be programmed. Yeah. So what is the passion behind that? I mean, you're giving your time, obviously. It's empowerment in a way. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's empowerment and access. I think uh, people talk about a lot of different things and different things, access to different things. There are parts of the world where there is not access to the basic things of food, water, and uh, shelter. Uh, but then once you go beyond that, there's also education which kind of empowers people to take care of not only them, but the generations to come after. So I think the access to education is one of the important pieces. And uh, that's, that's, that's been a kind of a passion that uh, allowing people the access, the primary access and sort of putting them on the path, uh, which allows them to explore further. Uh, that's kind of the passion. That's what we look for. It goes a bit in a loop in a way, because that's what you're doing at InMobi. You've put a lot of effort into exactly that education we're talking about, scan for, I'll get to that in a moment. But I guess the question for me is, it's almost autobiographical. Why do this? Why do this at this level? I mean, there are a lot of companies out there talking about what you can do and how you need to do it at a very high level. No, you go deeper. It's almost as if it's, as I said, autobiographical bringing back memories of maybe some of your pain points as a publisher, perhaps? Yeah, kind of, in some way, because I think uh, when I was a publisher early 2010s, the mobile world was pretty new. Everybody was building apps, was trying to figure out what is going on, how can we grow the apps. We went down the organic path and grew, but I think we realized over the period that there are a lot of other sophisticated tools that needed to be in place. And interestingly enough, uh, around that time, in Mobi was also one of the publishers that we had integrated to monetize our apps. So I have my sort of association with InMobi goes back then to 2012-13. And then InMobi itself goes back to 2008. 2007 was kind of the technically where we started, right? It's a really interesting journey how things have gone uh, over the last 10 years. And uh, to your point, yeah, it's kind of autobiographical in some way, because uh, three components to that, right? One, addressing your own pain point. The second component is uh, addressing anybody else's pain point, mm -hmm. allowing people access to certain things, making it easier for them. And the third is uh, uh, sort of being the torchbearer of a change and, and, and making sure that we're going down the right path and building the industry. Liking that analogy a lot yeah. because you do have to show the way. It is very murky mm -hmm. out there currently when you think about SCAN. And one thing you talk about is how SCAN is currently the current state mm -hmm. and you compare it to a three-legged stool mm -hmm. yes um one is almost mended which mm -hmm. is measurement we've mm -hmm. got our heads around that however optimization yeah that's another story 
targeting, of course, mm -hmm. another. Tell me a little bit about this analogy and how you're using this maybe to guide what you're doing at in Moby, what you're spearheading, the, the path, as mm -hmm. it were, that you are showing us. Yeah. So I think the way you look at it is the three-legged stool, right? It's a stool that if, if it's stable, you can jump on that stool and reach higher, uh, higher spaces. The same thing with user acquisition. If you have the three-legged stool, which is the right way to target the right people, uh, have the optimizations to have the sophisticated tech layer and be able to measure that accurately, all three things together, will allow you to do the build, test, learn approach pretty quickly and use that stool to sort of uh, amplify your growth strategy and reach the higher places and grow your business, right? Now, with SKAD Network coming in, uh, that kind of broke all three parts of the, of the stool. And uh, measurement was kind of mended, like you said, right? Because Apple came up with a framework and they said, okay, we're going to give you this one stool, one leg of the stool back. So it's kind of rebalancing the stool in a way or, uh, or sort of, you know, removing the old stool and building a new stool type of situation we're in right now. Probably something excites you, though. I mean, you could almost say, yes, it is not great what we have currently, but mm -hmm. For many people, they call it, you know, it's really leveling the playing field. It's really a new start to take it. And you've even said it yourself. You're quoted as trying to talk about a renewed optimism. Mm -hmm. So there's something good here. You know, a lot of marketers are looking back. Yeah. You look ahead. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of looking back. There is a lot of least path to resistance. And it's just a uh, common theme with change. It's, it's the whole story of uh, early adopters and then followers, right? So. With any new product, any new technology, there's always early adopters. This, with Scan, there is a set of early adopters even in the marketer's world. But at the same time, we are starting to get to that tipping point where we have to, uh, if we're ready, we're going to see a sea of people following it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And what we are trying to do is trying to play our part as a company, as a, as a thought leader who can come in and reduce the time between the early adopters and that rise, sort of that hockey stick you see. So I think what we want to do is we want to make it quicker and easier for people who want to adopt and uh, jump right in. Well, talking about adoption, I'm just looking at this. I mean, you started down this road in 2020, so mm -hmm. you were earlier than most, seeing that if you know, scan basically doesn't work if we all aren't certified by Apple, and you mm -hmm. were experimenting. What was that? Was that a hunch? I think there's two parts to that. One is it's just the DNA. The DNA overall as a company for Inmobi has been to sort of uh, uh, be as innovative as possible, build different solutions at different points in time that kind of solves for the problems uh, at that time. Uh, 2007, uh, in India, nobody was doing any mobile marketing is where Inmobi started. Yeah. Inmobi started doing mobile marketing, building SMS-based models, and then building a performance company, and then slowly building a network to the exchange, to the DSP. It's kind of, it has been an innovation and a ride for 15 years. Ethos has been pretty clear that we want to be innovative, bring out the solutions for the industry, stay ahead of the curve, right? So that's one thing that kind of drives that. Then the other piece was we foresaw that pretty quickly because if you follow the uh, the industry closely, you will see that Apple teased SK they Network hit. in 2018. Yes. A lot of people did not read too much into it, mm -hmm. but we did. And around the same time, we also thought that this is a good idea to start prepping for something if this becomes a reality. And it quickly became a reality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then we tested significantly with limited tracking devices to solve for that using a proxy. Mm -hmm. So uh, that has kind of put us ahead of the curve in some way. So it's not just about you understanding what's coming next, but also communicating that to marketers. Now, marketers, they are starting to move. But tell me about your conversations in the industry and what you're telling people here on the fence. Uh, our message to those people is pretty simple, that if you don't jump right now, you're going to have to jump at some point. So uh, how about this? Let's jump together. And we will uh, say, if you're trying to learn how to swim in the sea of scan, we want to be the instructors or the, 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 the party who helps you, right? So I think the idea is pretty simple that uh, at some point you're going to have to learn it. Uh, if you learn it in the beginning, uh, you are going to do it with a limited portion of your budget. You're going to do it with a structured approach, right? And you, there's not a lot to lose to begin with. And you slowly learn over the period. Let's say if you had started with scan 1.0 or 2.0, 2.0 to 3.0, pretty significant time, about a year now, right? And now 4.0, you learn over this period. But if you're not doing it right now and not focusing it, 
and you suddenly have to now jump into the sea with 4.0, it's going to be hard. So mm-hmm. uh, we would just say that do not wait. Let's just jump and we will swim with you. Some marketers want to do exactly that, but then they're also thinking, okay, so what do I tell my boss or someone over me? I wouldn't say the numbers will drop significantly, but you will see a shift, and a lot of people don't have a lot of patience for that, or they simply don't want to take the risk. So again, it's not just about education. It's about making people bolder, braver, Mm -hmm. helping them say something and find a script that they can use when they're explaining their Mm -hmm. actions, when they're explaining their decisions. Well, that's an interesting question. It's about being bold, right? Like you said. So it's harder to explain or uh, drive that boldness when you are not ready. You cannot force someone to play a game. You can always create the field and the environment and the situation for them to be able to feel comfortable to do it. So what we do is we do the same thing, right? We want to conduct sessions where we take them through uh, different ideas of what does this what does this really mean? Uh, you know, conduct a let's say a full length workshop on scan where we take them through what is it about scan? You start with the timeline, you talk about all the different versions, get into the 4.0. What does this really mean for them? Include a checklist and all that type of stuff, which helps them prepare, kind of do their homework for them in some way, and then take them through that, right? And uh, and that is what we're committed to. We have done it, we continue to do it, and we want to even expand down that path now. So now there's a different type of InMobi. It's more of a, as you said yourself, a guide, a Sherpa, hand-holding, helping master classes, workshops. I yeah. mean, what's it like now at InMobi, the culture? It's pretty great. It's a, it, it's full of enthusiasm. We have a lot of different products that we work on. And uh, I, again, the ethos remains the same, that we want to be ahead of the curve, build some innovative products, and we continue to do that. But while we do that, I think the idea is to handhold the industry in places where we need to be. Because if, let's say, we're ahead of the curve, we also want to bring people with us together to test certain things. Right? We are looking at it from a consulting lens, right? that I am mm-hmm. trying to be your partner in growth. I mm-hmm. want to be the consultant. And I don't want to be uh, just a media partner who comes in, runs that campaign for you, drives your results and just goes away or just, you know, that's a transactional relationship. That's not what we're interested in. What we're interested Mm -hmm. in is being the full scale partner in your growth journey and helping you in places where you need the help and, and wherever we can bring our expertise. That's very interesting, not being a transactional partner, because that's what the industry was built on at the first. I understand your motivation for that, but just overall in the industry, what has happened to change this mindset to think about really long-term partnerships? That's a great question. And I think uh, industry still needs a lot more work on that front, especially on the performance marketing stuff, because it is really, really performance focused. It is really results focused. Yes. So on the brand marketing side, you see this happen a lot where you have partners and companies who have longer term partnerships. On performance, it's still very transactional. But I think uh, a lot of this education piece is going to uh, sort of change that. The change in the industry is going to do that, right? It's not only scan. There is also a lot of other channels. The world is changing. The technology is changing. And with technology changing, there's going to be a lot more options, a lot more new areas that people can invest in. So how do you find someone who can help you through all of these? One example of that would be we're hearing all this talk about AI, right? Yeah. Not just talk, proof of yeah. AI, especially GPT-4, mind It writes marketing copy. Yeah. <laughs> Not just marketing copy. Now, now GPT-4 writes a product, writes a yeah. software. GPT-4 can pass a bar exam and lawyers can. A lot of prospective <laughs> lawyers can. I mean, that's the funny part of it, right? So the reality is, how do you use that type of technology, right? So for example, what can you do? Can you use generative AI to create creatives and test 1,000 different creatives without even having to? Uh, you know, put your creative team through that six month cycle of producing a hundred thousand creatives, right? You can do that. Mm -hmm. So having a partner who can perhaps help you do something like this, who can also do scan, who can also do some other interesting channels like influencer marketing, on device media and all that kind of stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, someone who brings a lot of value across the board. I think that's where the industry is going to shift or should shift. And I can feel from your interest and passion about education, your background, that you want to tinker with AI and some other things at InMobi. Is there anything you can maybe lift the lid a little bit? Because that passion must be based on something other than your interest. For me, yes, it's, it's, it's a matter of passion. You know, I've 
academically been trained for computer in computer science and data science. So that's something I've done. What I do today is very different than what I actually went to school for. I think from an immobile NCS, we're doing a bunch of things uh, that are kind of in tandem with that. One of the things would be, uh, I would say, the bidder itself, right? Mm -hmm. We've built this bidder for scan, and that bidder leverages a lot of AI stuff. And mm -hmm. we are going to continue to do some of that. And uh, in the future, you will hear more about what we do with the generative AI stuff. Interesting, yeah, because that certainly did make the headlines, having the first bidder of its type. Maybe congratulations oh. in order, because <laughs> it is a first. Um, I understand why that's important, but help me understand in the scheme of things, in the framework of things, why this particular step is a milestone step for you. The success of any performance campaign was dependent on a very strong bidder, has always been. Now, with SCAN, the targeting, uh, targeting measurement and optimization, all three legs were broken. Measurement was a little bit there, but again, the primary signal or set of signals that the bidder would rely on to drive the value were gone. So I think for us, it's a monumental uh, you know, achievement uh, to be able to build a bidder which is leveraged by machine learning or partly AI, ML AI, mm -hmm. and bring the same value that the pre-scan bidders would. In fact, in some cases, maybe even more value. So, and we are the first in the industry to do so. So we're not only adopting scan, but we have also built a bidder that focuses on the autonomous capabilities, right? Uh, we started out, it was a bold idea when we started building that. We had you know, gone through a bunch of uh, testing and stuff, and now we see success. And mm -hmm. I think that's why it matters the most. Tell me about the testing that went into that. I think it was something, don't have the numbers right now, but a significant number of installs that you were learning from. Tell me a little bit about what is going in to making certain that this bidder is not only smart from the start, but able to evolve. Yeah, exactly. That's a that's a great question. I think uh, two parts to that, right? Uh, one, for, for anything on scan to be successful, all the parties have to be ready. Uh, some of the primary components are, are uh, the DSP and the SSP. Since in movie is a DSP and SSP both, we kind of take care of that part, right? I think right now, if I look at the traffic, about 85% of... Uh, uh, in movie traffic is uh, scan 3.0 compliant, which is massive. And That's nuts. yeah, yeah, and in fact, uh, scan 4.0, it's 10% right now. Uh, I just looked at the data Friday; it's 10%, which is which is phenomenal. Yeah. So our team on one side is consistently working pretty aggressively on adoption. On the publisher side, the same thing we do on the advertiser side, right? Where we continuously work with the advertisers and test the campaigns. Uh, and real-time campaigns, right? We're testing these in the real time and comparing that data with the previous data, with the probabilistic data, and continuously improving. Uh, one of the ma main pieces is the contextual signals, the signals that you use. And also very important is the intelligence that you use in using the available tools. Uh, you only had 100 campaign IDs. How do you use those? Uh, well, if you are intelligent enough, you can use those 100 campaign IDs in 100 ways. So we did some of those things. You know, there's a lot of secret sauce that goes into that, uh, into sort of, you know, building that recipe. But God, that recipe is delicious. And you share it, which is good. So you're, you're, put, you're putting together something that's a great dish, mm -hmm. but you're also sharing. A, yeah. lot of, a lot of people at the table, which is in itself interesting to orchestrate mm -hmm. that because you understand it has to be the advertisers, mm -hmm. the publishers, mm -hmm. MMPs, other companies. Tell me a little bit about that, that orchestration to make certain you know, the dinner table is full and everyone's happy. What we say is that for, uh, for anything uh, related to SCAN, to be successful you need uh, six parties to be ready, right? Mm -hmm. The advertiser, the mm -hmm. demand side platform, the supply side platform, the publisher, the MMP, and then Apple. Apple is ready because they kind of orchestrated the whole thing. They own the table, I think. But... Yeah, they own the table, right? <laughs> but they also have the seat on the table. So they're yes. like, well, I'm sitting on the table. Yes. In Mobi, as a DSP and SSP, we are ready. We are getting the publishers ready in certain cases. Also, in some cases, in Mobi is also a publisher. We do have a side of the business, which is a B2C side. We own apps. We do have some other things. So we are kind of a publisher in our own right, but we do work aggressively with publishers to also you know, in, drive the adoption. Well, interesting piece is we also work with the MMPs uh, hand in hand, mm -hmm. testing all the different things on scan, uh, continuously uh, you know, working through different campaigns, testing, uh, and you know, that starts from not just measurement, but also the reporting side of it. So we work with the MMPs pretty closely uh, 
to drive adoption and in certain cases also sort of you know test campaigns together uh, do a lot of product to product uh, integrations product to product meetings to sort of you know drive some sort of uh, uh, I would say uh, thought leadership on in, in that area and also not only thought but product leadership as well so mm -hmm. As a DSP, we're ready. As an SSP, we're ready. We're driving the publisher adoption. So Apple is ready. And MMP, we're also working with them, and they're also ready. So now it's just the advertiser who needs to be ready. And once they're ready, we're going to have a good table full, uh, full of all the people who can enjoy that delicious meal. And uh, that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to also you know, bring value to the advertisers and bring them to the table mm -hmm. and drive that adoption as much as possible. So I have to ask, because nobody wants to be late for dinner, but as you said yourself, it's a little bit of a delay. Sometimes it's a, it's really just a, a mental thing. It's a feeling mm -hmm. that this is new territory, and I'm going to wait and watch everyone else. With any change, there's going to be a group of people who are risk averse. And to me, there is not a lot of risk here. Of course, it is complex, mm -hmm. but then uh, the way is always through. You cannot sit there and win, right? You're not going to be able to weather the storm sitting there. You have to go through the storm if you want to just to make that way. And this is not even that big a storm. I think a lot of, and I think the bigger piece is there is a lot of misinformation about SCAN in general in the industry. So uh, what that does is that indirectly sort of, uh, you know, uh, scares people. It's, 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 there's a bit of hoax and a bit of a uh, real problem. Hmm. So. Someone, I think first piece that needs to be addressed is uh, telling hoax and uh, the real problem apart. And then coming with a strategy on addressing the real problem. And how do you do that? You can only do that by finding the right partner and being bold enough. And I always uh, say this, right? Uh, one of my favorite, uh, one, of, or, or, one of my most favorite uh, sports person would be Michael Jordan, right? Now, if you trace back and if you've watched Last Dance, or if you trace back what mm -hmm. Michael Jordan achieved in his life, right? For the first 10 years, he did not win anything. Mm -hmm. But it's about persistence. It's yes. about having that belief and being able to get there. And once you assemble the right parties together, you can achieve greatness and change the game forever. So I think the same thing here, right? Uh, you sit there, nothing's going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same. It's kind of like... The people that Michael Jordan had in that room, when in that little story he says, when he's just a rookie, he sees everyone is partying, nobody cares, because everybody thinks that it's so hard and Bulls can never win, mm -hmm. right? If you keep thinking about that like this, right? That, oh, it's so hard, I don't know if it's going to happen, then it's never going to happen. You just mm -hmm. have to dive in, figure out, find the right parties, right partners together, put together that winning team. And I think the same thing in this case as well. The winning team for an advertiser is going to be the right DSP partner, the right MMP, the, you know, of course, uh, having the right team internally who can help them with the scan preparations and sort of build, you know, building that winning team together. Well, you're making quite an effort with your workshops and mm -hmm. your programs, but I have to also say that as a, as, as a non-marketing person, I was also impressed by just a very basic checklist. Mm -hmm. Taking all the anxiety mm -hmm. out of it is like, oh, it's four pages, nice clean bullet points. I've got this, right? Yeah. Um, why don't you walk through just a little bit of that with me to help me understand and help our audience also understand what's in it and how they can use it. I think there are three components to that. First is finding the right team. We already talked about it, so I mm -hmm. won't beat the dead horse there. I think the second part is around uh, using that right team in the right way. And I think the most important piece is going to be the conversion value mapping, right? Mm. Because the biggest problem has always been, especially with the IDFA not being available, the problem is how do you tie that back? Install, yes, Apple can yes. help you with that, but now with 4.0, they can help you with all the conversion values as well. So being able to efficiently use the conversion value mapping for your own use case uh, and driving that knowledge into the product updates and monetization on your side, I think that is going to be the critical piece. And how do you achieve a, an optimal conversion value mapping is what we cover in some of that checklist part. Uh, mm -hmm. Then there is also other piece, which is around uh, you know, testing. That is very important. You have to test. Uh, you have to allocate a certain part of your budget to make sure that you're testing it in the right way, optimize and learn faster 
And uh, so that's the second part. And we, we also explain in the checklist how to test and what percentage. So how do you, we also go super deep into uh, how can you define coarse grain values, fine grain values, what is a use case. If we are conducting a workshop with an advertiser, we take them through an example of all their events actually and show them this is how you can do it on your side. So I think the idea of how to use conversion values, how to use the postbacks, how to use the timers that Apple provides, how to use the right partners, and uh, how to test. I think it's a mix of five things together, uh, which kind of makes up that checklist. Not really, so not really complicated at all. Uh, if you go step by step, uh, it's pretty easy. It also depends, of course, on your app category or genre. Mm -hmm. Are people overthinking this? Are they saying, well, you know, game, game is game. No, I've got to go deep, deep, deep into the subgenres or subscription app, another big one, because mm -hmm. they are very into mm -hmm. thinking through conversion mapping. You know, is it, does it matter or does it just a subscription app? Just want to understand if people aren't just overthinking this and therefore, again, not getting involved and being put off again by mm -hmm. the complexity. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 some bit of overthinking, but I think uh, you can always deconstruct the complexity. So within gaming, I think there are, if you zoom out, there are two standard models for monetization, right? You have in-app purchases, in-app ads. So you have IA or IAP is how you typically look at any game. The purchases are where you have subscriptions. It can be the, it can be free to play plus freemium sort model, mm -hmm. or it can be just right off the gate, you have to pay something. It's a paid model, right? It could. The idea is someone is paying something within the app uh, in the beginning or sometime to unlock certain feature. That is one model of monetization. The other is just in-app ads. Now, the primary metric for both is very different, right? Mm -hmm. For example, if I am, and I think it's it's much harder for in-app ads. For example, if as a publisher, if I like I was monetizing my app with ads. If I were to create a conversion value map, if I had a game and create a conversion value map, what would I do? I would do. I would look at it from this angle, right? Coarse grained and fine grained. So if you, there are three levels, high, medium, and low, and there is zero to 63 bits, right? So what I would do is for every component, high, medium, and low, I'm going to add two events that make more sense. And those two events could be, let's say, uh, someone who signed up uh, or someone who, completed five levels, completed mm -hmm. 10 levels. Those could be the smaller ones, lower hanging fruits. And then you go deeper into the use cases, right? Where one of the really good ways to uh, attach the monetization from an in-app ads lens is the number of impressions. Mm -hmm. Number of impressions show, shown to the user or uh, number of ad slots, right? Some of that stuff will generally give you a good sense of the CPMs and help you drive the purchase. For purchase, it's it's black and white, right? Because if someone makes a purchase, you use that event as yes. one of the events. It's yes. much much more easier for them. So I think if a if a purchase if a subscription app is thinking like an in-app uh, ad advertising app and making it complex for themselves, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I think that's possibly it because they're thinking a subscription app is an entirely different type yes. of model. Exactly. So it, exactly, so I, I, the way I would say is this depends on the app categories, but it also depends on within the app category, what is your actual use case? I think this requires a lot more thoughtful thinking uh, mm -hmm. around the monetization of the user. So I think you know, well, if nothing, what this whole change in the industry will do is bring the acquisition and monetization teams super close. Mm -hmm. If they were if they were far far farther from each other, I think this is going to bring them really really close. And if they are close together, I think those teams, those companies, will win faster. Also about winning, people are talking a lot in the industry, and you're seeing it more and more. Is and you even mentioned it in your checklist as well. You're talking about um, predictive modeling, bridge measurement gaps with predictive modeling. Mm -hmm. Unpack that for that for me a little bit. So predictive modeling is a very standard concept for any bidder or mm -hmm. any, uh, any, let's say in the IDFA world, predictive modeling was only based uh, on predicting the CTRs, click-through rates, conversion rates after the click, and in certain cases, the propensity 
to click the propensity to convert and propensity to perform a certain action beyond the install, right? Mm -hmm. CTR, CVR, post-install CVR, all those were metrics that typically were used for predictions. And you use those predictions to sort of, uh, you know, create these smaller, these smaller segments of a high value user, a medium value user, or a low value user, right? Where I want yeah. to afford, a, am I going to, and then you assign a certain CAC value to that. And then you mm -hmm. arrive at an overall CAC for your uh, app. And then you sort of look at the LTV over CAC ratios, the ROAS and all that good stuff. Uh, in this case, you have to do the same thing. However, how do you do it? If you don't have the IDFA, you cannot yeah. pinpoint one user. So then you're going to have to pinpoint the cohorts of users. And when you do that, you're going to have to uh, modify your predictive modeling to go from one user to a group of users. So I think that's first fundamental piece. And I think the second piece is uh, with this new technology, there is some bit of uh, uh, sort of, you know, thresholds, the privacy thresholds, right? Once you, if you do not hit a certain threshold, Apple makes it sure that you cannot drill down to one user. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so, so in order to sort of work through some of those, some of those limitations or some of those constraints, I would not call it a limitation. It's a constraint. So some enforced constraints like privacy threshold. How do you get over that? You use predictive modeling to model the conversion value based on the historical data. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, for uh, for someone who understands statistics, it's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to use the existing data as a proxy to model the conversion value. On, even if you're not hit the privacy threshold, you can model the value and use some of that in your predictive modeling mm -hmm. as, a, as, as an input, as a feed. Once you hit the threshold, then you always have your system working the way it should anyway. So I think uh, it's, the word sounds pretty, you know, yeah. complex, predictive modeling, but uh, it's pretty, you know, straightforward. Pretty straightforward if you can also get your head around dealing with incomplete data sets, yes. which for some marketers is an impossibility. I mean, they're learning to love it now, yeah. but it was before, you know, the pillar of truth, that was the data, mm -hmm. and that was something to get over. As I said, I have to give you high five on your checklist, removing the anxiety. Let's talk a little bit about the marketer. Let's give them yeah. an imaginary scorecard, right? Give them a scorecard for where they are on the learning curve. I gave you a high five for your checklist. I don't know if they're gonna get five out of five. Go ahead. I think I would say that uh, that uh, scorecard, and this goes back to the education analogy, by mm -hmm. the way, and this goes okay. back, I think the scorecard is gonna look like a bell curve. Okay, yeah. So you have some marketers who get five and five because yeah. they are head first. And they have been working the with Thomas Petits of the world. Little, yeah. <laughs> little, little call out to Thomas. Yes. Yeah, but yeah I, know, I get it. I know a bunch of others too who we, yeah, yeah. Who we actively are engaging with, working mm -hmm. with, discussing different ideas with. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, they're head first. They're five and five. They're the outliers, right? But then majority of them are there in that yeah. median value. It's a bell curve. It's they're around like three, right? They were doing the bare minimum, testing a little bit, still relying heavily on probabilistic. Uh, I think they're starting to, that curve has to move. It mm -hmm. has to be more skewed, right? Okay. So I think what, what, if I were to use that, and this is a very interesting statistic and education analogy, right? That uh, we have to move that bell curve, the uniform bell curve. We have to move, transform that curve into a skewed curve, a right skewed curve, mm -hmm. which is going to be everybody on this side with four and five. So yeah. I think uh, that's one Herculean task that, that the industry has to, you know, together work on. And we, we li like to play a part in that. Actually, I was thinking it's not just a Herculean task. It's also a little bit of, I can imagine you a little bit like a Nick Fury, right? <laughs> Bringing together Shields. all the Avengers. You have to have Shields. the six parties. Yeah. The, yeah, it's a shield. Exactly. Yeah. So is that a new, a new, a new image for you? You're getting your head around this. So I'm gonna give you an idea. Get, yeah, get maybe a black I wear, coat. Yeah, just get a black coat and maybe an <laughs> iPad sometime. You know, just just be the pirate. But I'm not stealing anyone's attribution. So, because <laughs> uh, Apple's not gonna let me. No. So I think yeah, that's 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 funny you say that. I think uh, someone has to do it, uh, uh, and uh, if we can do it, why not? Absolutely. Well, I have spoken about education with you. I mean, you've traversed the ecosystem. Education, really, almost so much of it autobiographical, but so much of it also within what you're doing and what you're hoping to inspire marketers to do. Um, let's talk about you, though. Mm -hmm. What inspires you? <laughs> For me, I think uh, what inspires me, change. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting because a lot of people don't like change, and I like change. I think there is a, there is, it's, 
continuous change is, is, is very poignant. There is poetry in change. And I think the idea is that change has to be positive and constructive though, right? So you have to work through some of those things. So I think personal or professional life, the idea is that you have to consistently uh, not only foresee in cases adapt and in cases also be the, the, the pioneer of change. And uh, uh, that's what kind of leads to better, uh, you know, better communities and better societies and better world at the end. So I think uh, for me, that inspires me the most, being able to play whatever role I can in that change that is positive, uh, that has some positive impact. But sometimes, you know, when you're so deep into change, it can be a bit as if you're too far ahead and you start to think, am I here or is it maybe the right path or a little lonely out mm -hmm. there at the top? I mean, you, you say, oh, well, I like change, but it's not just that. You have to stay motivated when you have a feeling when I'm thinking about, for example, in Moby starting to test this in 2020, mm -hmm. it certainly wasn't what the industry was doing at the time. So tell me a little bit, not just how you stay motivated, but how you stay convinced. Mm. That's a great point. You, everybody has highs and lows. You know, sometimes you question the path you're on. Uh, and I'll give you a, an example of this, right? Because uh, this was a few years ago. Uh, I uh, was in the Himalayas. I've been there quite a, quite a few times, but this was like my biggest uh, wow, cool. uh, excursion out in the Himalayas where uh, I was out there for 10 days and uh, the, the, the objective was to uh, get to Annapurna base camp. And uh, it was a 10 day long hike and I had never done something as uh, sort of, you know, as extensive as uh you know as it was and uh when i was up there i think when i was going up there at some point uh i sort of you know injured myself a little bit but i kept going and i think one of the days i so i had a sherpa i had some other people uh not in my party but other parties other people who were around right it's a good community in the mountaineering world so mm -hmm. one of the times uh, one of the days for three hours i was lost and it was snowing and i was in full snow and i kind of i was lost meaning i had lost my sherpa i had lost other people and i'm walking and i i questioned myself a lot because i was mm -hmm. like uh is this is this the right path i'm going on and should i have done this because <laughs> am i prepared for this right but no i kept going i think i you have to mm -hmm. erase the doubt you have to if i think there's a uh, there, there is conviction. Once you have that conviction, right? There's some gut feeling, some conviction. Once you have that, even though you have questions on your path, you stay at it and you put in the honest work. Uh, and I think you will get through somewhere. You either succeed or you learn. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how it is. I said before about Nick Fury, but I have to say there is some sort of superpower about you, Dirac. <laughs> I have a feeling you stick to it. I mean, it's something that you want to look a little bit into the future. That also takes bravery. Um, tell me a little bit about where you think we'll be, because you've been working with scan adoption to further it. It's, it's a never-ending job. What can we expect next? I think uh, the next step, uh, baby steps. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to jump here from one hoop to the other. It's more of baby steps, uh, slowly learning every new change that comes into the industry. and. Uh, you know, working through that, uh, creating sort of a textbook for that or a, a practice for that that helps the marketer's job some bit easier, some bit faster, right? So I think uh, what, what the industry is going to see is with 4.0, the adoption has to go up and it's going to be, it will, it will, it will be a game changer in the scan adoption world, right? I think, and generally in the, in, in, in the industry itself because of the sophistication that comes with 4.0. There's a lot of sophistication. There's a lot of room to address those two other stool, other two legs of the stool, right? We talked about targeting and optimization both. Mm -hmm. I think uh, those two stools can be solved or fixed and the measurement stool will be sturdier and even stronger. Uh, I think, uh, sorry, measurement leg of the stool is going to be sturdier and stronger. So overall, I think, we are going down the path where the adoption is going to go up overall for SCAN and for what it means for us is continuing down this path and taking the advertiser along. And in, an, in a good world, by the end of 2023, maybe we'll have a 50% adoption. Then that is fantastic. Well, I'd say it'd be wonderful to meet again. Yep. 
and then we can talk about it, talk about what you did. And talking about Game Changer, I have to say it has been a game changer to have this conversation with you. I really enjoyed it. And I have to say a high five. Thank you. Thank at you. At five, it was the great. five o'clock club. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.